Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Michelle Sobolchik Petinato. And I have to really take my time to pronounce that well. She is a live sound engineer with a several decades long career that includes tours with, um, let me consult my notes here because it's a long list. Elvis Costello, Janet Jackson, Melissa Etheridge, the Goo Goo Dolls, Adam Lambert, Kesha, Jewel, Thievery Corporation. I could go on, but what really impresses me more than the length of the list is the diversity of different musical genres and stuff. Um, she's also the co-founder with Carrie Kyes of Sound Girls. She was inducted to Full Sail's Hall of Fame in 2015. She is to this day an active mentor and public speaker, but we're going to come back to all of that. Um, I'd like to start by just hearing a little bit about your background, because on the research that I've done, what I came up with was that you come from a very musical background, but you knew very early on that you didn't want to perform. Um, partly right. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I grew up in a tiny little town about as far away from the music industry as you could get. Um, just a little coal town in, in central Pennsylvania. And no one in my family had any musical background or any ties to the music business whatsoever. Um, I did, however, start to play piano when I was very young and I took lessons all through high school. And um, I was pretty good. Like I played for the school choir, the, um, the church choir. Uh, I played for my friends when they would compete in, in vocal competitions and talent shows, um, things like that. But I was terribly shy and terrified to be on stage. So I I did not want to be a performer. Like I, I always, I was fine when I was playing with the chorus because there were so many other people up there that no one was paying attention to me. But I, I did not want to be a, a musician um, per se. And I just really didn't have the the chops for that. Like I was good at playing, you know, reading sheet music and playing, but I didn't feel like I had the the level of skill to be a really qualified musician. The improvisational um, thing, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I wasn't good at making stuff up. And mm -hmm. but um I loved playing. It was just, you know, more for my own enjoyment. But I, you know, music since I was a little kid was always a huge passion for me. And um, it was probably somewhere around high school when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do, like where you're going to go to college, what you're going to do with your life that I decided I wanted to make records. I, I still, I wanted to be creatively involved with music, but I didn't want to be a performer. So that was one way if I became a recording engineer, I could still be involved somehow and, and get that, you know, creative uh, fulfillment, but not have to be on stage. How did you even get exposure to the idea of a recording studio in, in the environment you were growing up in? You know, um, my mother had a very eclectic record co collection. Um, I don't know if you remember the KTEL Record Club back then. Oh, God, yes. Uh-huh. So she belonged to that. And every month or whatever it was, we'd get all these random weird records, um, everything from John Denver to ABBA to KISS, you know, and and I listened to all of it. And um, I, I just loved music and I loved everything I could get my hands on from classical to rock to, um, you know, folk, anything. And I would read, when I was listening to the records, I would always read the liner notes, you know, from end to end. And I noticed that every single album had this thing called a recording engineer. And I didn't know what that was, but I thought, well, they must be important because they're on every single record. They're part of, of a record. So um, I think it was my senior, junior or senior year in high school, I had a music class and we had to give an oral report on anything music related. And I decided I'm going to do a report on recording engineers. I have no idea what they do, but I'm going to find out. And I, I started to do some research and, and wow. that's kind of when it's like, yeah, this is for me. This is what I've got to do. And I mean, clearly you must have had some draw also to the whole, you know, the left brain technical side of things to be interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I loved taking things apart. Um, I loved figuring out how things work. Like I was very science minded. Um, like I had all those little, um, they had these little kits when I was a kid, like you had these springs and you connect them with wires and yep. make light bulbs come on and weird yeah. things like that. I mean, I loved all that stuff. And, um, I remember, remember having um, a record player and I, I took it apart to try and make it 
spin the other way to play my records backwards to hear all the, the backwards messages. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, like all kinds of goofy stuff like that. So, so I was fascinated by, you know, the process like behind all this stuff. Um, and, and I, you know, it's funny cause I was just talking with someone the other day and I remembered how, when I was a little kid, I had, um, I had a stereo that had a mic input and my dad was, um, he had a little two track from when he was in the service and it had a little crystal microphone with like an eighth inch plug. And I used to have my girlfriends come over, we'd put a record on and I'd have them sing along with the record while I was recording it into the tape cassette. And then I would sing over top of it. It was like, I was already multi-tracking when I was like 12 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and so you were a nerd from early back. I totally was. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's interesting though, that you were drawn to that side of things, you know, and, and were able to actually pursue it considering the environment you were in. Like you say, you weren't in a place where you had those kind of resources. Yeah. And yeah, there weren't it, any it, schools back then either. No, I mean, I, so it started where I was going to go. There was a, a university in central PA called Susquehanna University that had a music program with a small recording arts program in, inside of it. And I wanted to enroll there, but I, it was really expensive and I didn't have, um, like my family had no money. So when I was growing up, it was like about a month or two before, um, classes were supposed to start at college and my financial aid just didn't come through. Like, it was just like, I was going to have to come up with 10 grand in a month to, to go to school there. It was just like, well, that's not possible. Uh -huh. So I enrolled in uh, Penn state, like community college for the, the first year, figuring it the next year, I'll start saving money and try and go to Susquehanna. So I had like, while well, I was at Penn state majoring in music, I had one music course and I was just kind of realized, I'm like, this is not going to get me to where I need to be. So I heard of the recording workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio, which was like a, a three-week program in basic recording arts. And then I think there was another two, week or two of, of studio maintenance after that. So I went there and um, I just dove in and I, I kind of got like a really good basic background in studio engineering. Um, and from there, I, I started working at a little radio station and um I went in, it was a brand new radio station. And then I went in and applied for a job and I said, yeah, I'm a recording engineer. I want to make commercials. And they said, great, but you have to sell them first. So I was basically Oops. selling radio ads. <laughs> you learned to be an entrepreneur at an early age too, obviously. Yeah. It, it's interesting because broadcast is like one of the, it's one of the first avenues in for a lot of people and, you know, who don't have the, you know, when you're in a city or a small town that doesn't have the, the music infrastructure per se, you know, mm -hmm broadcast is still kind of an avenue in. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just like, I, I was there for, I don't know, you know, maybe six months, seven months or so. And then in, at the same time, I had a cousin who had moved, uh, recently moved to Nashville. So she said to me, why don't you come down here and stay with me and see if you can get a job? So this was when Nashville still had, you know, Music Row was lined with studios, you know, and there was, people were still recording records in studios. I remember studios. So, yeah. 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 So I, I went down and stayed with her for three weeks and I literally walked around Music Row every single day, knocking on every door I could find, handing out my resume, which was all of like WMGH and the recording workshop, <laughs> like, you know, and realizing I don't know anything. I have no idea how to get into this industry. I still don't know enough. What am I going to do? And I, I went back home to Pennsylvania and it was somewhere like, a you know, shortly after that, I saw an ad for Full Sail. And called up, got the brochure, and enrolled. And um, that's a big leap too. Didn't you know, run down to Florida like that? You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it, it was huge, and it was again. It was like, okay, how am I going to afford this? Because you know, it was just like student loans out the wazoo to pay for sure. it. You know, and working while I was there and anything I could. But as soon as I got started there, I, I like I knew like, okay, this I'm this is I'm in the right place. Like I'm I'm going to get to where I need to go from here. But um, at the time, the school was still a very small um, school. Like now it's this, I mean, they do everything from gaming to computer animation, video. I mean, it right. was just a recording arts program back then. But um, about three or four months in, I had, um, and they, the way they structured it was you had one course at a time. So you were in recording arts for one month. Then you were in music business for a month. Then uh, MIDI for a month. In, um, so then I had a course in live sound. and even though I'd gone to concerts growing up and, and um, 
loved going to see concerts. I never, it never occurred to me that you could actually do that for a living. And as soon as I had the course in live sound, it was just kind of like the light bulb went off because I, I desperately wanted to travel and see the world and, and mix music. And I thought, well, if I can do all that and get paid for it, this is the career for me. And, and I just completely shifted gears. And um, as soon as I graduated, started working at a local sound company and just kind of kept going from there. It's interesting, you know, that that's a big fork in the road for a lot of people when they're first getting into the music industry is whether they whether they're drawn towards studio or live mm -hmm. you know and there's different personality types that are drawn to each one because yeah. you know on one you're very meticulous and you're crafting something and then the other you're one shot and you better get it right you know and and so some people are more drawn to the the travel and the you know the the spontaneity of live and mm -hmm. other people just kind of prefer the the studio life so it's, it's it's always interesting to me to see which you know what people are drawn to in that sense but yeah. clearly you started putting in your your ten thousand hours right i mean working at clubs and everything while you're there oh but, god yeah. yeah i mean i i was so when when you at the time when i was going to full sale when you graduated you had to do a 240 hour internship before you got your actual diploma i did that in two and a half weeks wow that's a that's a lot of hours yeah. Um, you know, cause they want you to actually have some real world experience, but like, yeah. So I went to work for this little company and I did it in two and a half weeks. It was just, they worked me nonstop. Like I was in the shop working from nine to five every day. And then I would go out and do shows like as the second or third on the crew, you know, from Thursday through Sunday. Um, it was just round the clock basically. So you got, you got really the trial by fire on pretty much everything all at once. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was great because I, I was like, I was learning how to build cases, how to clean equipment, how to repair speakers. And then I'm out doing shows and I'm kind of like just the, the, you know, the bottom person on the crew, but I'm seeing what everybody else is doing and kind of learning how to prep gear for, for a show. And cause I would be the one getting everything ready in the shop and then loading the van or the truck and then unloading it when it came back after You're doing the it whole well. process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that you're learning that I think really serves everyone well is you're learning the people skills. You're learning yeah. how to be a good hang. You're learning how to be a part of a team. You're learning about not just the stuff that you're doing, but you're learning, as you say, you're learning what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And knowing clearly what everybody else is doing not only helps you do what you're doing better, but it helps you be just a, big, a, a better part of this whole energy that is a team. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's, that's one of the things that I think is the most important about just getting in and getting your hands dirty and really, you know, yeah. learning that because I think the people skills are the really huge. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had so many different jobs um, in the industry before I actually went on tour and every single one of those taught me different skills and, and things that I needed to know that I didn't even know I needed, you right. know, like the people skills, uh, politics, um, you know, politics of, of working for a corporation, uh, which is very similar to working for an artist, you know, and, and just yeah. how to uh, work under pressure and, you know, everything. Yeah. Navigating. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that's the stuff that, you know, you really can't replace. There's nothing, there's no course that can teach you that. That's, that's the real life stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And the other thing about that, and we can sort of weave this into your own story too, is you have to be there. You have to show up for things, you know, like you're talking about the idea that you basically did whatever people asked you to do within the realm of reason, of course, or, mm -hmm. well, you know, the, the, those, those boundaries are, are, are flexible when we're young too, you know, it's like uh, 18, 20 hours, no problem. Three days of OAK. Cool. I'll try it. Right. You know, <laughs> right. Right. But, um, but I think, you know, in putting in that time and, and always being there, that's how you end up with those great, you know, right place, right time breaks, right? Like your, your first gig was with a band that got big right away mm -hmm. as soon as you you know you like grabbed onto the back of the bumper and all of a sudden boom it's it's going 100 miles an hour you know yeah. but it happened also because you were everywhere yeah yeah um that was uh, i um my first tour was with spin doctors and mm -hmm. um that came directly from a classmate I met at Full Sail, um, a guy who we became friends and he knew how badly I wanted to go on tour. And he, he, we had worked together down there. So he knew my work ethic. He knew what I knew. He knew, you know, how I operated. And, um, 
he ended up after full sale, uh, I think going to work for audio analyst at the time. And he just went right out on tour as a, as a PA tech, you know, for tour after tour for a couple of years. And the, uh, he became friends with the booking agent for the spin doctors and they were just kind of starting to get a big buzz around them. So he had just finished a tour and the agent called him up and said, Hey, I need you to go out and mix this band for me. They're starting to do something and I need somebody qualified in there. So he said, okay. And he got like about, you know, a month or two into it and realized it's like, you know what? I just, I need a break. I don't want to be on the road right now. I've just spent three years on the road. So, uh -huh. um, he called me up and asked me if I was looking for, for work. And I was like, you know, if I wanted the tour and I was just like, absolutely. I never heard of the band, didn't know anything about them. And, um, the, uh, the funniest part of the whole thing was like, so, you know, this is back in the, um, early nineties and, um, back in the, in the eighties, I'm sure you remember the book. I think it was hammer of the gods, the Led Zeppelin story. Yep. I had read that thing from end to end so many times, you know, and I had all these ideas of what <laughs> life on the road would be like. So he tells me to, to come down. It's like, you know, they're, they're playing this club about an hour away from where I was living. He said, come down, you know, meet uh, everybody, get on the bus. And then two weeks later, you'll have two weeks. And if they like you, great. If not, two weeks later, we'll be back in your area and you can just get off the bus and go home. So he tells me to come down, look for the, uh, the tour manager, this guy named Jason. So I'm thinking like, you know, Peter Grant, like some huge, you know, monster <laughs> of a guy. And I drive into the parking lot at the club in the afternoon and I see this guy, he's like this skinny guy, looks like a very young Johnny Depp, you know, and he's got a Salvador Dali mustache. He's got <laughs> silk running shorts on, a tank top and a pink bandana tied around his head with white bunny rabbits on it. And I'm like, okay, who's this guy? So I ask him, I'm like, hey, I'm looking for Jason. He's like, that's me. And I'm like, this does not compute. <laughs> <laughs> you're the tour manager and it was just like the like okay I guess the road's going to be a little different than I expected you know but it was uh yeah that was um so I did I did the two weeks they loved me and um I stayed and and a month later their album was just blowing up and and you know in the charts and rode that wave with them so it was great I think the cool thing about that too is you know you you, you come across with an attitude of just being ready to work with anybody and, you know, just wanting to be, wanting to be a good person and work with, work with mm -hmm. anybody, regardless of how big they are, you know, it, it's not about only latching onto the really great opportunities. It's, it's about latching onto opportunities to learn stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and like, that's the thing too, like, you know, when you're working with a band that's up and coming, even after you've established yourself, there's an energy there that, you know, there's a, the drive, like the hunger that they have that the established artists don't have, yeah, you know, like yeah. not that they're any, any less, but when, you know, you're trying to make that first big record or, or first successful tour, it is, it's sure. just, it's, it's a great energy to be around. And it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, like we were all in it together. Like I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm finally on tour and they're, you know, just, they're getting their, their first big hit. Um, so we were a very tight little family for years, you know, it was all the same people just, we just kept rolling and, um, it was a really, really great experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that, you know, that, of course that happens in every tour where you're in your own little bubble and you really do become family, but, mm -hmm. but for you, especially because it was your first tour, you know, that's gotta yeah. be really special too. Um, of course I want to segue into that fun topic of sexism. <laughs> No, What's that? I, you know, <laughs> no, what I really like is um, you have a certain attitude toward it. And it's, um, you know, I've been, uh, been working recently with um, some folks who are just putting together a movie about Ethel Gabriel. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a great quote that uh, from Ethel Gabriel that I think really kind of sums it all up. She says, um, I just didn't know that I was someplace that I wasn't supposed to be, you know, and that I think is really the epitome to me of, you know, the way that the most, the, the strongest women that I know, that's how they handle it by disempowering it completely. You know, it's like, there's no issue of gender here because I'm not going to let there be an issue of gender. And I think that is really, I, I think such a great, cool way to motivate people to work against it, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult topic because, um, you know, I'm sad to say that it seems to be worse now than it was when I started in the industry. And it's different. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. And yeah. I don't know if, if that's good because there's more women now than there were. Um, and we were kind of like the unicorns back then. So people were like, wow, that's weird. That's cool. Yeah. Now yeah. it's your competition. I, I don't know. But um, when, when Carrie and I started Sound Girls, that was one of the things we discussed a lot about, like, did we feel that we met with sexism? Um, was it an issue for us? And, you know, it, it was so long ago. I think for me, um, I was just so focused on this is my dream. This is what I'm going to do with my life. I don't, no one's going to stand in my way. I don't care what you have to say about it. This is what I'm doing. And I was super driven. Um, and also it was just, I was so focused on getting my next gig, like just keeping working that all of that other stuff was noise. And I'm sure I, I met with sexist comments. I mean, like my, my first job at that night or at the, the sound company, like I would go out, there was another guy that we'd go out and do um, a local band at this bar um, every week. And we'd go and set up in the afternoon and then we'd leave and go have dinner and come back at like nine o'clock to do the show. And every night the bouncers would try to charge me the cover charge thinking I was the sound guy's girlfriend. And I'm like, no, I'm here to work. You know, it's just like stupid stuff like that. Yeah. Um, there was never anything that prevented me from doing my job or getting like in my way. Um, yeah, there was, I'm sure, a number of comments and, and people looking at me weird, like, you're actually this, who are you dating in the band? You know, that kind right. of stuff. But right. it's like, you just, you can't fixate on it because you get caught in that, you know, you you start to fixate on it, you let it spiral out of control in your head, and then you, yes, you get a battle stance. You, you get a battle stance, and then there's no progress on either side in that sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I it was kind of like, <clears throat> I, I was, like I said, I was so fo focused on just, you know, trying to survive in the business and keep working and, and you know, and building my reputation and my career that I let a lot of that stuff just, I ignored it, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, whether it was that I choose, you know, my battle wasn't to change the industry at the time. It was to just survive. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, if, if, if that, I, you know, I don't know, is, it's, is, was that wrong? If I, I, sometimes I wonder, like if I fought harder against those stupid comments back then, would it have been easier for women now? Who knows? I doubt um, it. I doubt yeah. it because this is, it's, it's not only is it a generational thing in that sense, but it's, it's something that is really, subject to each individual situation you know yeah you're going to find some people who are going to be supporters you're going to find some people who are going to be dicks and there's really you know and there's a whole spectrum in between those yeah and i, I always found like for me it was kind of like you have to teach people how to treat you you know if i walked yeah. in there all meek and like oh my god i don't belong here because i'm the only girl then people would walk all over me but i walked in there like this is my job i'm here to do my job and and i'd have guys who would try to be like you know, all over the console, you know, telling me what to do. And I'd be like, yeah, I got it. If I need your help, I'll, I'll let you know. But, um, and, and, you know, part of it is because they've never seen a woman engineer. So they automatically assume you'd have no idea what you're doing. You're just here because you're dating somebody in the band, whatever. But, um, you know, very quickly they'd realize like, wow, you actually have your shit together and you know what you're doing and you're pretty good. So, I would, I would love to always see like, you know, uh, with local crew and local sound people, when I'd walk in, how their attitude changed by the time I left that night, you know, from watching me, like they'd look at me all skeptical, like, oh, what's, who's this chick? And by the time I left, they were like, can I copy your EQ settings on the drums? And, you know, what were you using on this? And well, so because by the time you're done with that, you have, you have now gotten them to view you as an engineer, not as a woman engineer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that I think is, you know, I mean, in the perfect world where, you know, I, I'm not a male engineer, you're not a female engineer, you know, we're just engineers mm -hmm. in, in that, in those kind of roles. But I think you're right also that it's changed a little bit now because there are more women in the industry, which I think is wonderful, you know, and I'd, I'd like to see even more, but I think you're right that now it's almost like, um, it is almost a competition in that sense. Yeah, I, I was very disturbed to find I, there was a group of girls out of Webster University who I'd kind of, um, I, I had met up with them in, I think it was 2015 at AES, and we kept in touch. And whenever I came through the, the city on tour, they'd come out, you know, to, to the show and kind of shadow me. 
And it was over a period of a few years. And I was really saddened to find out that the one girl, she was getting ready to graduate. And she had said that, you know, when she had started the program, they were all, you know, audio majors. She said, for whatever reason, her senior year, all of her male friends at the school had turned on her. And she said, when I started, everybody treated me great. And this year, I don't know if it's because they didn't think I was going to make it or, or, and now they're seeing me as competition or what, but now no one, you know, like they can't be bothered by me. They don't want to talk to me. Like they've shunned her. And she said, I really, I'm not doing anything differently. And I really have no idea what happened other than did they just think, oh, she's not going to make it. So whatever. And now that they see I am, and I'm doing better than half of them, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say what it is, but it's, it's just sad. I wonder if that's part of it. You know, I wonder if part of it is that now some of these guys see them as not only competition, but see them as perhaps having an advantage by being a woman. Possibly. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a different people's insecurities play in different ways in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the other side of it too, though, is where, you know, and I always have to be careful about this, but you always find what you're looking for. Yes. And Thank you. There's, you know, if you're looking for sexism, you're going to find it everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, and I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a gig and the first person I meet from the house, from the venue is telling me where the dressing rooms are, where production is. And because they think I'm the production assistant or the wardrobe girl. And I say, oh, that's okay. But I'm looking for a front of, I'm actually the front of house engineer. And they'll look at me and say, oh, oh, cool. Not once has anyone said, well, you're not going to be the front of house engineer in my venue. You know, it's just, they meet, you're met with surprise, not you know, consternation. And, and I wish that, that, that even wasn't the case though. You know, I wish it was like, Oh, okay, cool. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but like, the thing is like, if I let that upset me, then that sets the tone for my whole day. And now I'm expecting everybody that I meet to have this attitude where it's just like, look, they've never seen a female front of house engineer before. So now they have, and maybe the next woman who walks through the door, they're not going to just assume she's wardrobe, but why should I let that bug me? You know, now, if they were going to tell me that, no, you're not going to run the board in my venue, then that's a different story. But um, there's so many little things that it's just because people haven't been exposed or they, they say something that they didn't really mean, or they didn't mean it as derogatory or, con, you know, condescending, but you took it that way because you believe everyone is sexist. And that just, it's really hard to grow. And it's really hard to do your job well when you have that mentality, because it's constantly in your brain and you're just, you're spinning out on it all day long instead of focusing on your job, which are, these jobs are, are intense, you know, they require a lot of, a lot of focus. So. It's true. It's true. And that's why I think, you know, you've, you've always had a really good approach to it by not letting that get to you too much. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that you and a lot of other people, especially within Sound Girls have done for a long time is really working hard to build community. And part mm -hmm. of that is really sharing that wisdom. And I, you know, I do feel that even though things are still, you know, there's still a struggle there. And there probably will be for a long, long time. And there's always going to be some form of sexism and, and discrimination on all fronts in that sense. But what you guys have done is to share the wisdom and to create a sense of community where people feel like they can come and talk to advocates, you know. And I loved it even years ago when I first met Carrie that she wanted to make sure that everything was very inclusive, mm -hmm. including not only women of all stripes and colors, but all genders of, you know, supporters and advocates. And I feel like, you know, that's, if we're building a positive community, you know, then yeah. we're helping everybody and, you yeah. know, the rising tide lifting all boats, you know, I love it when I see other guys getting down on men mistreating women and stuff like that, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, that's, that's the only way it's really going to take effect is if we all do our little part, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's, um, th I think that is the biggest thing right now is we all kind of need to be a bit more aware of what is happening around us. Um, over the past few years, I've been part of a lot of discussions, um, about, um, diversity and sexual harassment. And I always find it shocking. Like I've, you know, I guess I've been lucky. I've never really experienced sexual harassment in my career. I've had a very positive experience in my career, but 
I meet young women who not, not 20 years ago in the last 10 years are meeting with sexual harassment and things that I'm just appalled to hear that they're dealing with. Yeah. And, um, there was one situation where I was, I was recounting, you know, a, a, a girl's story about what she had been dealing with. And it was a group of, you know, white men, probably late forties and up that were veteran touring engineers. And they were, they were astounded that this is actually happening. And I was like, yeah, it's happening now. Not, not, I'm not talking 20 years ago. I'm like, this is like in the last five years, this stuff has been going on. Insane. And they just couldn't, you know, couldn't believe that this stuff is still happening. And I think, you know, I found myself too, where I found out things have happened on tours that I was on and, and I was not aware of it until after the tour was over. And I was mad at myself for not being more aware of, you know, like you're, you're in on the road, you're, you know, your days are, are busy. So you're kind of focused on your job, but then there's the whole world that's happening around you. And I think if we can all be a little bit more aware, especially for the younger generation, the people who are just starting out, you know, if a young woman who's on her first tour and she's working for a company, you know, if she starts meeting with sexual harassment, what's she going to do? Is she going to call the company and then they pull her off because they don't want anything to happen to her? Is she going to tell the production manager and then he replaces her because it's the guitar tech who's been there for 20 years and we can't get rid of him. So we got to get rid of her. So there's no problem. Yeah. So you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And when you don't have, you know, have that, it's different now, like where we used to have a family, you know, on tour because we didn't have all these screens to be distracted by. You got, you had to get to know each other. People kind of tend to not know who they can trust. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's important for those of us who have have been around longer, who have reputations, um, to reach out to those younger, you know, women and 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 men too who may be, you know, dealing with whether it's mental health issues, discrimination of any kind, sexual harassment, and just let them know, like, if you have a problem, I have your back. You come to me, and yeah. and I'll have your back for you because. The, they're very often, you know, there's no HR on the road. So what do they do? Where do you go? What, who do you talk to without putting yourself into a position that you don't want to be in? So not only no HR, but then you've got this whole almost surreal situation that you're living in for mm -hmm. an extended period of time where you have this bubble, you know, you're going from town to town. You're really in certain ways isolated Yeah. from, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of people that are coming to see you. There's you know, and, and so you get this really, as you say, not only this insular kind of group of people, but then there's, you know, little clicks and everything in between. And mm -hmm. it just, yeah, who do you talk to when you're new and inexperienced? When do you even question, you know, am I, am I wrong? Did I screw up? Those right. kind of things, you know? So yeah, yeah it's, it's great to see that you're doing that. And that's one of the things that I love that Sound Girls has been doing actually has been really promoting that kind of information um, you know, those kind of panels and stuff like that. I think that's really great. Yeah. And uh, so let's also make sure that we mention your own, uh, your own mentoring in course. You do a, a website called Mixing Music Live. Talk Mixing about that music a little Live. bit. Com. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I started MixingMusicLive.com in 2019. Um, kind of, it, it was first, I focused on, uh, it's an intro to live sound and mixing. And it, it's an online course that for anybody who, you know, if you're in a high, in high school and you want to run the board for the high school theater or your church or um, somebody who's interested in getting started in live sound, you know, there's so much information out there and it can be really overwhelming that it can be very difficult to know where to start. So I created Mixing Music Live to, you know, it teaches uh, the fundamentals, like the most important principles that you really need to know. Things like signal flow, gain structure, how to choose a microphone, where to put the mic, um, how to use the soundboard, analog and digital consoles, uh, you know, how to get the best results to, to mix a live production. And um, I, I, it kind of came about because I found a lot of aspiring sound engineers go about it backwards because there's, you know, with digital consoles, especially there's so many different kinds and they feel like, I, I don't know which one I need to learn. Like I have to learn all of them, but if they actually learned signal flow, they'd be able to operate, all of them. you know, yeah. You yeah. can know where every every button knob and fader is on a Yamaha CL5 and know exactly what they do. But then when you're in front of an uh, Avid SXL, right. if you don't it's understand rude. signal yeah. flow, you're completely lost. Right. So, and then the next tour is a Digico and you, you, you're starting yeah. all over again. And yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So when you learn the principles, it just makes it that much easier. Sure. Um, and then when the pandemic started in 2020, um, as soon as I got home from tour, uh, I created a second course called Listen, which teaches how to improve your mixes with um, using EQ. Also how to do critical listening and learn frequencies, which is basically the hardest part about using EQ is knowing which frequency to adjust. Yeah. So um, I created that and um, launched that in 2020. And um, that's for sound engineers. Um, I, I've actually got a lot of students who are uh, recording musicians. They they spent the pandemic, you know, building their home studio and recording and producing their own music. And they want to start mixing it rather than having to pay other people to do it. Um, but aspiring producers, anybody who, whether you're mixing live or, or in the studio, it's, it's, it helps you improve your mixes. It is definitely useful. I, I spent at least a whole, uh, a whole session in my class teaching them about EQ and mm -hmm. uh, the, the use and abuse of it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a right way and a wrong way for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What do they say? It's like spices, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, you've done so much really great stuff to give back, which I think is so important. And, you know, I, I always really love seeing that. Um, you want to leave younger people with some advice? What would you tell 15 year old you? Oh, um, hmm. you know, I think the biggest thing is to, as, as soon as you know what you want to be, find a mentor, find somebody who's doing exactly what you want to be doing, or at least what you think you want to be doing. And, and start a relationship with them, you know, pick their brain and, and, you know, um, just get as much advice as you can and, and learn how to listen. Because when we're getting started, I think we all have the same problem of, we want everybody to know what we think we know. And we tend to miss a lot of really wonderful wisdom coming from people who know more than us, because we're so, um, we just feel like we have to prove that I'm not no, I know this. And, and when we're, we're just saying, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, I get it. I get it. All that great wisdom is just going over our heads and not really getting into our brain. And so it's important to learn, you know, find someone who you can learn from and actually learn how to listen, just put your ego aside and soak in everything that they're willing to share with you. That's very wise. I like that. Michelle Petnato, thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.